Welcome to our AAPS webinar this evening. Thank you all so very much for taking the time to be with us. As you can see from the slide on the screen, we have a very important topic lined up for tonight with a quite distinguished speaker. Many of you know me, but for those who don't, my name is Jeremy Snavely. I'm the business manager for AAPS. Dr. Heidi Klessig attended medical school at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she also completed a residency program in anesthesiology. She received the American Board of Anesthesiology Certificate of Added Qualification in Pain Management. A founding partner of the Pain Clinic of Northwestern Wisconsin, Dr. Klessig was also an instructor for the International Spine Injection Society. After her husband was diagnosed with a brainstem tumor, she retired in 2007 and co-authored a book, Harvesting Organs and Cherishing Life. She also maintains the website respectforhumanlife.com, which highlights the ethical questions surrounding transplant practices. Tonight, we are very privileged to have Dr. Klesig present on what physicians and patients need to know about the dark side of organ harvesting, uh, Dr. Klesig, I'll go ahead and turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much for your willingness to present to our group tonight, and welcome to our webinar. Thank you, Jeremy, and, and thank you to Drs. Uh, Orient, Kohansky, Chester, and Page for welcoming me to the Association of American Physicians and Surgeons and for giving me this opportunity to speak to you all today. Uh, this talk was prompted by an article I wrote for American Thinker entitled, Would I Receive a Transplant? So I'll, I'll give you the answer right up front. The answer is, it depends. It's some, types, some types of transplants are ethical, some are not. So as I review this topic tonight, I'd like for each of you to consider how you would answer this question for yourself. Would you receive one of these various types of transplant and why or why not? With a hat tip to a certain spaghetti Western, I am going to divide these transplant types into the good, the bad, and the ugly, with two in each group. So I'll start by briefly reviewing the good transplants, tissue donation and living donation, as well as the bad transplants, forced harvesting and organ trafficking. And then I'm going to spend most of our time discussing some of the ugly facts about so-called brain dead organ harvesting and donation after circulatory death. Now, this is a really timely discussion because the Uniform Law Commission is currently working on redefining the legal definition of death in the United States. So starting out with the good, uh, tissues, unlike organs, are very resilient to a lack of blood flow and they can be harvested from a biologically dead donor. Uh, as you know, tissues are things like corneas, skin, bone, heart valves. So would I receive a tissue donation? Absolutely, I would. However, tissue donations are not without problems. Uh, this LA Times article from 2019, in the rush to harvest body parts, death investigations have been upended. Uh, Melody Peterson, the reporter, detailed over two dozen cases in which the organ procurement organization was allowed to harvest the tissues of registered organ donors before the pathologist or coroner determined the cause of death. Some of these families actually begged the OPO not to harvest until their questions surrounding these deaths were answered, but were refused. These families were left without closure or justice. For example, this is a photo of Christy Rettenmund, who was the daughter of former Major League Baseball player Merv Rettenmund, and she died in the hospital in 2013 after suffering apparent violence. Her boyfriend, had had previous arrests for domestic abuse. But because she had signed an organ donor card, the organ procurement organization was allowed to harvest her body prior to the official autopsy. And later, the pathologist was unable to determine at autopsy whether her death was the result of a crime. So why are OPOs in such a hurry to harvest? I mean, why would they refuse to honor the request of the family not to harvest until a death determination could be made? You know, as they say, follow the money, right? This graphic is from the LA Times article. And you can see for yourself, I mean, these are, these are 
big numbers. So for a piece of skin about the size of a sheet of typing paper, $16,500. For ground bone mixed with stem cells for back surgery, $2,550 for one teaspoon. Now, of course, these are processing fees. Iran is the only country currently where it's legal to sell body parts. What about organs? These numbers are from the Milliman Group. As you can see, if you add up the charges for both tissues and organs, the body you give away for free can be worth well over $5 million. Uh, Milliman calculated for 2020 that US transplants would generate over $48 billion in total bill charges. So because organ procurement organizations are permitted to harvest tissues from registered organ donors before an official coroner's report, I recommend that no one be a registered organ or tissue donor. If you wish to donate your tissues, simply notify your family that they may release your corpse for tissue donation after all their questions regarding your death have been answered. So I recommend you don't sign a donor card. And if you have signed, you can easily have your permission removed at the Department of Motor Vehicles. But sadly, this may not be enough. The 2006 update to the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act now mandates that individuals who refuse to donate must explicitly state so. This is the way the statute reads. If family is not reasonably available and there is no documented evidence of the decedent's choice not to donate. The administrator of the hospital shall make an anatomical gift of the decedent's body or part. So if you are incapacitated and your family cannot be located, this act puts the decision whether to harvest your organs and tissues in the hands of people whose interests might be more aligned with their own agenda than with your wishes. We have a link on our website to this downloadable wallet card from the Halo Voice website. And Life Guardian Foundation also has a downloadable medical card to protect and preserve your life. Uh, in addition, uh, you should have your wishes documented in your electronic medical record. I mean, if you're incapacitated, who knows where your wallet ends up? So please you know, put it in the electronic medical record, which should follow you almost everywhere you go. Moving on to the other good type of transplant. I don't want anyone to have the idea that I'm against transplant because I am not. Living donation is the happy story of organ donation and transplant because everyone remains alive after the procedure, right? Uh, just about anything except a heart can come from a living donor. I mean, if you have donated blood, congratulations, you are a living voluntary donor. You can also donate things like bone marrow, skin, stem cells. You can donate one of a pair of organs, such as the kidney, which is the most common living voluntary organ donation. You can give a section of intestine or of pancreas. You can give part of lobed organs, such as the liver or the lung. Uh, in living lung transplants, interestingly, the recipient receives one lobe from each of two donors. Now, family members often can donate to a relative due to genetic similarities, but unrelated people can also become living donors. As in this example, uh, two longtime Atlanta Healthcare Center co-workers uh, each had a husband who needed a kidney transplant. And even though each wife was not a suitable match to donate to her own husband, surprisingly, they were each a match for the other one's husband. So in March of 2021, each donated a kidney, which was successfully placed in the other woman's spouse. In addition <clears throat> to these being a wonderful example of selfless service, these donations are generally more long lasting and successful. This is because the organ can be removed in one operating room and immediately taken to a waiting recipient in the operating room next door with a very short ischemic time. Well, that was the good, now for the bad. Forced organ harvesting is the execution of a prisoner via the harvesting of his or her organs. This is happening right now in communist China where political dissidents and religious minorities, most notably uh, the Falun Gong practitioners, but more recently also the Uyghur Muslim and the house church Christian populations 
are forced to undergo blood and tissue typing as part of their arrest. Their organs are then put on the market for transplant tourists who come to China from all over the world to have their transplant surgery on the day that the prisoner is executed by organ removal. Uh, this picture is from the documentary film directed by Leon Lee. David Mattis, a civil rights attorney, and David Kilgore, the Canadian ambassador to Asia, have written a book entitled Bloody Harvest on this subject, and they're both interviewed in the film. I won't kid you, the documentary is tough to watch. Some of the toughest scenes for me showed the sorrow and pain and regret of people who had received an organ in China and only found out later that it was from an executed prisoner. The United States still permits insurance companies to pay for Chinese organs, though the practice has been banned in Israel, Spain, Italy, Taiwan, Norway, and Belgium. The good news is that people are working to end forced harvesting. Uh, here are a couple of organizations among many uh, that are worthy of, of your review. Uh, Doctors Against Forced Organ Harvesting and the International Coalition to End Transplant Abuse in China. Last year, the US proposed that the United Nations investigate the situation of the Uyghur Muslims in China, but unfortunately, China was able to pressure the majority of nations to vote this down, including getting Brazil and India to abstain. Moving on to organ trafficking. I've already sold my daughters, now my kidney, winter in Afghanistan slums. This is an article from The Guardian, uh, January of 2022. Organ trafficking is the exploitation of the poor who are offered a paltry sum to donate an organ to a wealthy recipient. Even though the exchange of organs for money is illegal, except in Iran, the World Health Organization estimated in 2009 that one fifth of the kidney transplants worldwide that year came from organ trafficking. You know, as you know, organ removal involves major surgery and complications can occur. These poor donors may be left without resources to face these complications alone. And lest you think this doesn't happen in industrialized countries, here we are, March of this year, a Nigerian senator and his wife were convicted in England of conspiring to exploit a man for his kidney. After they brought this man from Nigeria to the UK, the victim refused the procedure and contacted the police. The newspaper report said that this was the first conviction under modern slavery laws in England. Uh, the uh, couple and their doctor who coordinated uh, this organ trafficking experiment were sentenced just a week or two ago. The senator received nine years and eight months, his wife four years and six months, and their doctor to 10 years in prison, respectively. Now for the ugly facts about donation after brain death and circulatory death. I'm gonna spend a bit more time discussing brain death because the Uniform Law Commission, as I mentioned, is currently working on a new model statute, which will change the definition of legal death in the United States. I think the tragic death of actress Anne Hesch is a good example of the current controversies about so-called brain death. Uh, Anne Hesch's Mini Cooper ran off the road and collided with a house last year on August 5th. Anne was conscious and communicating with first responders at the scene. The day after the accident, her spokesperson reported that the actress was currently in stable condition, but by August 8th, she was described as being in a coma. By August 11th, a spokesperson said she was not expected to survive, and doctors declared her brain dead later that same day. But because she was a registered organ donor, she was kept on life support until her organ harvesting on August 14th. So the LA Times reported her death on August 12th with the morning paper, since brain death equals legal death in California. But the New York Times and Washington Post held their obituaries until her death by organ harvesting on August 14th. The Washington Post's obituaries editor, Adam Bernstein, explained, it's black and white. There's no gray area here. If you're on life support, you're still alive. Other publications can make their own judgment about when they're comfortable publishing. I'm comfortable when somebody is actually dead. 
So when is somebody actually dead? In biological terms, death is the loss of the integrative functioning of the organism as a whole. I mean, we're more than the sum of our parts. The many systems of our body work together during life in a seamless unity. When we die, this intricate harmony ceases. Our heartbeat and breathing stop. The body becomes cold. Bacterial growth in our intestines becomes uncontrolled, causing putrefaction. And the three Abrahamic faith traditions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all define death as equivalent with biological death. Traditionally, it is the departure of the spirit uh, that causes the loss of bodily integration. So for thousands of years, doctors and everybody else used the absence of biologic activity as being synonymous with death. In fact, in times past, people were greatly concerned that death not be declared prematurely. But the definition of death changed after the first successful heart transplants. Now, there had been a couple previous heart transplant attempts in December of 1967, but the hearts of the donors had been stopped before being removed. The transplants were not very successful as the recipients lived only a few hours to a few weeks. But in South Africa on New Year's Day, 1968, a black man named Clive Hout suffered a brain bleed while picnicking with his family and was rushed to the hospital. His attending physician, Dr. Hoffenberg, was approached that same day by the transplant team who asked him to declare Hout dead. Initially, Hoffenberg balked at declaring a breathing, heart-beating man dead. Reportedly, one of the transplant surgeons said, God, Bill, what kind of heart are you going to give us? I mean, meaning that if Mr. Hope's heart was allowed to stop, it would become ischemic and would rapidly become unsuitable for transplant. So I think under considerable pressure, the next morning, Dr. Hoffenberg relented and pronounced Hope with his beating heart dead. His heart was removed and was given to a retired white dentist. The dentist in this case lived 19 months and 15 days before dying of heart complications. Doctors now faced a dilemma. They knew that Hope's death declaration was on shaky ground, ethically and legally, but success of the transplant showed that fresh, viable organs were an absolute necessity for a successful transplant. So eight months later, an ad hoc committee at Harvard Medical School redefined death. And here's a screenshot of the landmark JAMA article, a definition of irreversible coma. The ad hoc committee said, our primary purpose is to define irreversible coma as a new criterion for death. Now, there were no new tests, studies, or evidence that comatose people were dead. The committee provided only utilitarian justification for the new definition. First, they said the burden is great on patients who suffer permanent loss of intellect, on their families, on the hospitals, and on those in need of hospital beds already occupied by these comatose patients. Second, they said obsolete criteria for the definition of brain death can lead to controversy in obtaining organs for transplantation. So this redefinition allowed organ procurement to skirt the dead donor rule by simply declaring, I mean, by fiat, by the stroke of a pen, that comatose people were dead. The dead donor rule is not a law, but it's an ethical standard. And it states that people must neither be alive when organs are removed, nor killed by the process of organ removal. So basically, brain death is a legal fiction. It is not true biological death, but a legal way to remove human rights from vulnerable people. <laughs> um, between 1968 and 1981, it was the wild, wild west in the world of brain death determination. Um, by 1978, over 30 different diagnostic criteria had been published, none of them validated, neither had any consensus on the conceptual brain emerged. So in 1981, a presidential commission was convened to determine if the Harvard Ad Hoc Committee's redefinition of death was truly death. The commission did maintain a biological definition of death, the loss of integrated functioning of the organism as a whole. 
However, they believe that the brain was the master integrator of the body, without which integrative functioning would very quickly be lost. They thought, you know, on the order of days to maybe as long as a week in children. Secondly, they asserted that the development of technologies such as ventilators to sustain life masked that death had already occurred. The findings of the President's Commission were codified into law in 1981 as the Uniform Determination of Death Act, the UDDA, and all U.S. states currently have some form of this law on their books. The UDDA defines death as uh, irreversible cessation of circulatory and respiratory functions or irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain, including the brainstem, is death. But is the brain the master integrator? In 1998, this was disproved by Dr. Alan Schumann, a pediatric neurologist at UCLA, who documented 175 cases of so-called brain dead people who lived after the declaration of death under the UDDA, some ultimately for more than 20 years. These 175 brain dead people continued to show integrative functioning of their bodies. They had wound healing. They had spontaneous movements. They had maintenance of body temperature. They mounted appropriate stress responses. They fought infections. They went through puberty. They gestated pregnancies. A recent article on brain death in pregnancy I just saw reported that of the 35 cases studied, 27 healthy babies were born. How many times have you seen a corpse give birth to a live infant? Dr. Doyen Nguyen is both a theologian and a hemopathologist. She obtained her doctorate in moral theology, specializing in end-of-life ethics. I, I like the way she answers the question, does the ventilator mask death? She says, death and life are mutually exclusive. Does machinery somehow have the power of producing life? Also, the ventilator only insufflates. It has no power over gas exchange or respiration at the cellular level or at the capillary alveolar interface. I like this last one. If it is true that the ventilator masks death, are there other patients in the ICU that are actually dead and are fooling doctors and nurses? I mean, really, would your gross anatomy cadaver look alive if you attached it to a ventilator? So because of continuing controversy about brain death, another president's council was convened. This council decided that since integrative function continues after an accurate diagnosis of brain death, a re-examination of the neurologic criteria for death was needed. They noted that Dr. Schumann's work left two options. One, abandon the neurological criteria for determining death altogether, or two, develop a new rationale for explaining why neurological criteria should equal death. Well, I'll give you just one guess. Which did they choose, right? Okay, so the 2008 President's Council on Bioethics coined a new term, total brain failure. And they said an organism is no longer alive when it ceases to perform the, quote, fundamental vital work of a living organism, the work of self-preservation, achieved through the organism's need-driven commerce with the surrounding world. Without any real reason being given, the council singled out two forms of such commerce as being significant, breathing and consciousness. And just like that, the definition of death changed from biological to philosophical. Since it's been established that brain-dead people have continued integrated biological function, the definitions of death have shifted to questions of the essence of humanness. Well, the 2008 President's Council Chairman, Edmund Pellegrino, disagreed and wrote in his minority dissent, ideally, a full definition would link the concept of life or death with its clinical manifestations as closely as possible. The only indisputable signs of death are those we have known since antiquity. That is to say, loss of sentience, heartbeat and breathing, modeling and coldness of skin, muscular rigidity, and eventual putrefaction as a result of generalized autolysis of body cells. 
basically the 2008 President's Council failed to accurately reflect the science. First, total brain failure is inaccurate as people with a clinical diagnosis of brain death still have certain brain functions. 20% have an EEG with electrical activity. Over 50% have a functioning hypothalamus, a part of the brain. Uh, secondly, wound healing, fighting off infections, and the stress response to the incision to remove organs are all reactions to the environment and a way to express a need for self-preservation. Third, uh, Dr. Schumann points out, lack of breathing and consciousness is too broad. It would include fetuses in early pregnancy that do not yet breathe or have consciousness. And uh, though there is controversy over whether fetuses are persons, no one claims that they are dead. Well, two years later, in 2010, the American Academy of Neurology came out with new recommendations for the determination of brain death. These guidelines assert that brain death is a clinical diagnosis that can be made by bedside examination. The exam for brain death only tests for unresponsiveness, which, as we all know, is not the same as unconsciousness, since people may be conscious and just unable to respond. And according to the study that uh, you'll see by Schnakers when you get your bibliography, clinicians actually misdiagnose conscious patients as unconscious about 40% of the time anyway. Secondly, the guidelines only test for the absence of certain brainstem reflexes, and ancillary studies are not required. These guidelines do not meet the requirements of the UDDA for irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain since only the brainstem is tested. And as I mentioned, 20% of these people still have electrical activity on EEG and a functioning hypothalamus is found in about 50%. I do appreciate that at least the AAN was honest about these guidelines being only opinion-based and not evidence-based, in fact, they included this handy table to remind us that these findings are based on uh, insufficient evidence, insufficient evidence, weak evidence, insufficient evidence, insufficient evidence, and a paucity of evidence. And they conclude by saying, because of deficiencies in the evidence base, clinicians must exercise considerable judgment when applying the criteria in specific circumstances. And in fact, the American Academy of Neurology, the Society of Critical Care Medicine, the Child Neurology Society, and the American Academy of Pediatrics plan to release a new joint statement on death determination standards later this year. Here's Dr. Nguyen on the AEN guidelines. With its assertion that the presence of neuroendocrine function, reflexes, and spontaneous movements is compatible with death, the AAN standard contradicts both scientific realism and the tenets of sound anthropology. In 2012, Dr. Ari Jaffe, a pediatrician and critical care specialist at the University of Alberta, surveyed neurologists, neurologists being the experts most often tasked with determining brain death. Nearly half, 48%, equated brain death with death because of a higher brain concept of death. For example, irreversible loss of consciousness or personhood rather than uh, death as a biological state. And more than half, 54%, did not think that brain death and cardiac death are the same state. So when death isn't a biological state, determinations of death become an opinion a judgment of what makes life worth living. And with this shift to non-biological definitions of death, our patients are not being given truly informed consent about organ donation. Uh, this comment came in from someone who was reviewing our book. When I considered being an organ donor, I was under the assumption that once I was pronounced dead, all my organs shut down, including my entire brain, and my body dead and cold, that then I would certainly share any parts of my body that may help someone, I was wrong. The public at large still believes when they sign a donor card that they will be biologically dead when their organs are taken. They are not being told that they will still have a beating heart, wound healing, the ability to fight off infections, etc. They're not being told that the definition of death is now philosophical, not biological. They are being misled. 
David Rodriguez Arias, a researcher in moral philosophy and bioethics at the University of Grenada writes, policymaking becomes indoctrination whenever public opinions and preferences are intentionally manipulated in ways that destroy or prevent citizens' independent judgment and rational deliberation. The history of death determination in the context of organ donation can be described as an indoctrinating attempt to settle a moral controversy. Also, there have been many cases of people recovering from a brain death diagnosis. In 2007, Zach Dunlap suffered a head injury after a four-wheeler accident, and it was a bad accident. I mean, he had brain matter coming out of his ear, and he was pronounced brain dead according to the UDDA criteria. He even had a cerebral perfusion scan that showed no blood flow to his brain. Thankfully for Zach, he had a cousin who was a nurse and who was skeptical that Zach was actually dead and performed a simple bedside neurologic exam, even as the team was coming to harvest Zach's organs. Thankfully, Zach reacted to pain. In a, two, a 2019 interview, Zach said, the next thing I remember was laying in the hospital bed, not being able to move, breathe, couldn't do anything on a ventilator. I heard someone say, I'm sorry, he's brain dead, he's passing away. And there's nothing I could do, just get mad. I couldn't do anything to sign at all. I tried to scream, tried to move, just got extremely angry. I mean, obviously Zach was not unconscious when diagnosed brain dead, just unable to respond. Dr. Leo Mercer, Director of Trauma Services at United Regional Hospital, told NBC News that no mistakes were made in Zach's diagnosis of brain death. So how did Zach Dunlap have a physical exam consistent with brain death and a no-flow cerebral perfusion scan and yet wake up, right? Well, it was most likely a case of global ischemic penumbra, which I can explain to you uh, with this little table here. Uh, normal cerebral blood flow is about 50 mil per 100 gram per minute. When blood flow decreases to about 20 mil per 100 gram per minute, the EEG becomes isoelectric. But tissue necrosis does not begin until about 10 mil per 100 gram per minute. So between 10 and 20 mil per 100 gram per minute, blood flow is just enough to prevent necrosis, but insufficient to support function. Thus, GIP, a potentially reversible phenomenon, could be a perfect mimicker of brain death. Dr. Schumann writes about global ischemic penumbra. This is not a hypothesis, but a mathematical necessity. I mean, if you're counting down from 50 to zero, you're going to go between 20 and 10, right? The clinically relevant question is, therefore, not whether GIP occurs, but how long it might last. If in some patients it could last more than a few hours, then it would be a supreme mimicker of brain death by bedside clinical examination, yet the non-function, or at least some of it, would in principle be reversible. Moreover, standard tests of intracranial blood flow, which are not even required by the guidelines, may lack the precision necessary to distinguish between penumbra level flow and no flow. Uh, Jahai McMath is one of many lawsuits that occurred during this time. In addition, you may have heard of Aidan Halu, Bobby Ray's, Israel Stinson, Alan Calloway. This 13-year-old suffered cardiac arrest after a post-op bleed following tonsillectomy. She had a brain death diagnosis made according to the 2010 AAM standards, making her legally dead in her home state of California. She had four isoelectric EEGs, a radioisotope scan showing no intracranial blood flow, three apnea tests, and... Her parents saw laying in the bed there, their little girl with her heart beating, and she was warm, and she was their little girl, and she was not dead. And so they moved her to New Jersey, the only state in the union which has a religious exemption to a brain death diagnosis, where she lived for four more years. Three months after moving to New Jersey, she experienced pubertal development and menarche. I mean, how many corpses in your experience go through puberty and start to menstruate? She began to respond to commands and showed heart rate variability to her mother's voice. Her MRI nine and a half months later showed gross preservation of the cortical ribbon, thalamus, basal ganglia, and cerebellum. 
And though she had fulfilled the AAN guidelines for brain death, two neurologists later testified that she was not brain dead, but in a minimally conscious state. Now, the fact her MRI showed preservation of her brain's upper structures indicates that she too was likely in a state of GIP when her brain death diagnosis was incorrectly made. So in response to a number of recent lawsuits related to brain death determination, the American Academy of Neurology, among others, has proposed a revision to the UDDA, what's being called the RUDDA. I'm an observer to the Uniform Law Commission as they're currently meeting to rewrite the definition of death for the United States. And this was what was up on the screen at the end of their February meeting. Uh, an individual who has sustained either permanent cessation of circulatory and respiratory functions or permanent coma, cessation of spontaneous respiratory functions and loss of brainstem reflexes is dead. Uh, note that the term irreversible is being changed to permanent and all functions of the entire brain has been changed to coma, loss of breathing, and loss of brainstem reflexes. So let's go through these changes. Change number one, replace the term irreversible in the standards with the term permanent. Now, irreversible is commonly held to mean not capable of being reversed. The term permanent is being defined as meaning that doctors are not going to attempt to reverse the situation. Thus, people whose prognosis is death will be declared legally dead before they die. This is another change from a biological to a philosophical definition of death. Dr. Ari Jaffe compares this to saying that a drowning man is already dead because no one is going to swim out to save him. Second change, they're going to narrow the definition of brain death from the entire brain to just selected functions of the brain stem that can easily be tested at bedside. I've already told you about 50% of patients diagnosed as brain dead still have a functioning hypothalamus, giving them hemodynamic stability. The functions of the hypothalamus are being excluded from the category of brain function. Why? The hypothalamus is arguably more important to the functioning of the organism as a whole than many brainstem reflexes. I mean, wouldn't you rather have hemodynamic stability than pupillary constriction? I mean, give me blood pressure and a pair of sunglasses, please. Also, when you look at the diagram here, I mean, for teaching, we can highlight different parts of the brain in different colors and, and it's helpful, but in life, all parts of the central nervous system are interconnected and work as a functional whole. I mean, last I checked, even the spinal cord is still considered a part of the central nervous system. So to divide off parts as not being pertinent to brain death is just gerrymandering. And this one really burns me. Uh, change three, eliminate the need for consent prior to brain death testing and allow it to be performed over the objections of a surrogate. In particular, the apnea test disconnects people from the ventilator for up to 10 minutes and can exacerbate brain damage. The apnea test does nothing for the patient and can only cause harm. It only benefits some unspecified others who want the patient's organs. Now, this is a move backwards in time to 20th century medical paternalism. This is not a direction in which we should be moving. I'm glad to tell you the RUDDA is being opposed. The Catholic Medical Association and the Christian Medical and Dental Associations have written letters to the Uniform Law Commission protesting these changes. And Dr. Schumann and 107 experts in medicine, bioethics, philosophy, and law have submitted a paper which states, People have a right to not have a concept of death that experts vigorously debate imposed upon them against their judgment and conscience. Any revision of the UDDA should therefore contain an opt-out clause for those who accept only a circulatory respiratory criteria. The good news is that the current draft of the RUDDA contains an opt-out clause. Uh, which will allow you to avoid having your death diagnosed by the neurologic criteria if your preference is stated ahead of time. Hopefully this opt-out language will survive the next meeting of the ULC in July, but this is why we're asking people to please write a letter to the Uniform Law Commission protesting the proposed changes to the UDDA and demanding that if they are written into law that an opt-out clause be provided. All right, one more. We're gonna talk about donation after circulatory death. In the 1990s, a so-called new donor pool was rediscovered. Of course, it wasn't new because during the early years of transplant prior to 1968, 
Organs were removed after biological death for transplant, but the considerable ischemic damage they had suffered compromised transplant outcomes. These patients are not brain dead, but they're very sick. They're not expected to survive, so their care is withdrawn in a way that allows their organs to be harvested. How does this work? The patient is taken to an operating room or room nearby with a transplant team ready to go. Uh, medical support is withdrawn and the patient is monitored until their pulse stops. DCD does not require EKG silence, but rather no pulse. And after a two to five minute wait, these people are taken to the OR for organ harvesting. But is two to five minutes enough time to be sure they're really dead? Many medical professionals are not comfortable with harvesting organs after only two to five minutes of pulselessness because we know patients are routinely resuscitated after this amount of time. The first time I gave this uh, talk, a young nurse in the audience commented that she had just participated in resuscitating someone after 10 minutes of cardiac arrest, and the patient walked out of the hospital with only mild neurologic changes. Dr. Ari Jaffe has documented multiple cases of people whose hearts were not resuscitated, but spontaneously started beating again after up to 10 minutes of stoppage, and some of these made a complete recovery as well. Many European countries find this to be an unethical practice. DCD is banned in Finland, Germany, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Hungary, Lithuania, and Turkey. And the Ministry of Health in the Netherlands is currently considering a proposal to ban DCD there as well. Here's a case which demonstrates why the practice of DCD is problematic. Pronounced dead twice, what should an attending physician do in between? This is a 2021 case report detailing what happened to a young woman with Down syndrome who suffered a ruptured brain aneurysm, but was not brain dead. Her family consented to have her support withdrawn in a way that would allow donation after circulatory death and organ harvesting. This is from case report. After consent was provided, she was terminally extubated. The heart rate and oxygen saturation levels dropped rapidly. She had no measurable blood pressure, no oxygen saturation, no respiration. A physician listened to her heart for an additional two minutes. During that time, no heart tones were heard. She was pronounced dead at 2.59 a.m. After cardiac death was pronounced, they began organ procurement at 3 a.m. It was seen that her aortic and renal arteries were pumping and pulsing. The organ procurement was stopped. It was noted that she had spontaneous agonal respiration. Okay, her heart has started beating and she's gasping for breath. At the time, the patient was given additional doses of fentanyl and lorazepam. Subsequently, she was pronounced dead a second time at 3.17 a.m. The cause of death was determined to be homicide. I mean, I'm surprised it got reported, and I have a feeling it happens more often than we know. Well, if it can get even more gruesome, believe it or not. If the donor's heart is to be harvested, the circulation to the brain is clamped off, then the organs are reoxygenated and the heart restarted to be sure they are healthy enough to be transplanted. This is called normothermic regional perfusion with controlled donation after circulatory death, and this is the protocol for this procedure from the University of Nebraska. First, they open the chest through a standard sternotomy. Then they ligate all of the blood vessels that supply blood to the brain to ensure that blood flow to the brain is not reestablished once circulation is restarted, which effectively is making you brain dead on purpose, courtesy of your doctors. Uh, then they initiate cardiopulmonary bypass, which will reestablish the flow of blood to all the organs of the body, including the heart under normal thermia. The initial step for ligation of the blood vessels to the head is necessary to ensure that blood flow to the brain does not occur. Otherwise, you might wake up, right? And then number five, once blood flow to the heart is established, the heart will start beating. Now, remember the UDDA. This was supposed to be the irreversible cessation of circulatory and respiratory functions. I mean, how irreversible is this if your heart is restarted in your own chest? The American College of Physicians recommended in 2021 that the practice of NRPCDCD be paused as the burden of proof regarding the ethical and legal propriety of this practice has not been met. The uh, practice is banned in Australia. Dr. Matthew DeCamp, a bioethicist at the University of Colorado says, restarting circulation reverses what was just declared to be the irreversible cessation of circulatory and respiratory function. 
It is no defense to suggest that the patient was already dead when the action negates the conditions upon which the determination was made. Dr. Wes Eli, a critical care physician and transplant pulmonologist at Vanderbilt told uh, MedPage today, we're so hungry for organs right now that we are pushing all the limits. I just want us to be super cautious. We need to press the pause button on this and have some more conversations so that we can set up boundaries and stay in the right lane. The dignity of the human who donates the organs should never be sacrificed. Well, even though people are calling for pauses left and right, uh, one center after another is continuing to implement uh, this procedure. So to summarize uh, donation after brain death and donation after circulatory death, I'm going to quote Verheiji et al. Uh, heart beating or non-heart beating organ procurement from patients with impaired consciousness is de facto a concealed practice of physician-assisted death and therefore violates both criminal law and the central tenet of medicine not to harm patients. Just a quick summary of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Tissue donation and living donation are ethical good things to do with the caveat against so signing a donor card, which leaves you vulnerable to being harvested before the cause of your death is determined. Forced organ harvesting and organ trafficking are unethical and to be condemned. I am asserting that brain death and circulatory death harvesting are unethical because Number one, advances in medical science have made the old definitions of death obsolete. We talked about how recognition of global ischemic penumbra phenomenon has the potential to save people once written off as brain dead. Uh, Dr. Cicero Coimbra from Brazil has found that these patients have a secondary central hypothyroidism due to low cerebral blood flow. By simply replacing thyroid hormone, the component of myxedema coma can be removed, which may lead to recovery of brain function. Um, Alan Calloway, who I mentioned earlier, was a seven-year-old near drowning victim, and he was diagnosed as brain dead, but treated with thyroid replacement and is now disabled, but able to live at home with his family. Uh, Dr. Paul Byrne just emailed me a few days ago about a 15-year-old who had a cardiac arrest on March 27th. His family refused the apnea test. I mean, the RUDDA hasn't been passed yet, so they're still allowed to refuse, and instead requested that thyroid functions be tested instead. And he was found to have low thyroid and was treated, and now he's taking some breaths and his pupils are beginning to respond to life. Next, the use of functional MRI has allowed early detection of covert consciousness in patients with acute severe traumatic brain injury. The pioneering work of Dr. Adrian Owen showed that patients previously thought unconscious are able to answer questions during fMRI scanning. And last, uh, Dr. Sam Parnia, a resuscitation specialist, has reported that hypothermia is commonly used in resuscitation, can delay return of brain function after rewarming by as long as seven days. How many brain dead patients would have recovered if only their doctors had waited a little longer? And though it was once thought self-evident that adult brain and spinal cord could not regenerate after injury, there is now evidence of both neuroplasticity and neuroregeneration in the adult brain. Terry Wallace was in a minimally conscious state for 19 years, but spontaneously awakened in 2003. So labeling patients as brain dead is a self-fulfilling prophecy since they either become organ donors or have their support withdrawn. And this has curtailed research into how to better help these brain injured people. Secondly, I think that these are unethical practices because in order to allow continued transplantation, the definition of death has been changed from a biological to a philosophical or opinion-based definition. Dr. Ari Jaffe writes, I have argued that brain death is not death itself. It leads to death when and only when ventilation is stopped and therefore breathing stops, followed by cardiac arrest, followed by irreversible loss of circulation, and this is death. Further, I believe that at two to 10 minutes after loss of circulation, the DCD donor is not dead. This is because there is not necessarily irreversible loss of circulation. When exactly the state of irreversibility occurs is an important question. At present, this is not known. However, it is known that it is not at even 10 minutes after a cardiac arrest. 
Whether I'm challenging the practice of organ donation is another question. The question is not whether organ donors are dead, because they are not. The question is whether organs can be harvested before death from patients whose prognosis is death and hence be a contributing cause of death. My argument is that this is the current practice, and this is also precisely what needs to be debated urgently. Is organ harvesting before death violating respect for persons and using them as means? I would agree that it is. Even transplant proponents like Drs. Miller and Trug write, brain dead donors remain alive and donors declared dead according to circulatory respiratory criteria are not known to be dead at the time that their organs are procured. Drs. Miller and Trug want to be more honest with the public about the fact that organ donors are not dead, but since they're in favor of continued transplantation, their solution is to change our cultural ethics at the end of life so that it is morally permissible to harvest organs from living people. Dr. Vedix helped write the AAN guidelines for determining brain death, and he stated in 2006, the diagnosis of brain death is driven by whether there is a transplantation program or whether there are transplantation surgeons. I do not think brain death examination now in practice would have much, if any, meaning if it were not for the sake of transplantation. I mean, these comments seem to indicate that brain death is purely a utilitarian construct meant to facilitate organ harvesting and for transplant. Third, I think brain death and circulatory death are uh, unethical because people surviving a diagnosis of death are evidence that these re redefinitions of death are faulty. We have the photos and stories of over a dozen of these people on the survivors page of our website, and Dr. Schumann has over a dozen more listen, listed in a recent article. And last, brain dead and circulatory death harvesting are unethical because the public is being denied truly informed consent when they sign a donor card. Dr. Michael Nair Collins writes, appealing to the good consequences of organ transplantation in an attempt to justify the lack of transparency, if not outright obfuscation on which the transplant enterprise rests, is not a very compelling argument. So what would good informed consent at the DMV look like? How about this? I'm required to read this informed consent statement prepared by the Surgeon General before you register as an organ donor. If you consent to be an organ donor, irrevocable organ procurement policies are set into motion to be sure your desire to be an organ donor will be honored. A legally appointed healthcare surrogate, spouse, or family member cannot stop this process. Even though you're declared legally dead, your heart is still beating, your lungs aerate with the help of a ventilator, and your vital body systems continue to function. And during the surgery to procure your organs, you are not guaranteed anesthesia to treat objective signs of bodily distress. You should also know that some people have recovered with ongoing medical treatment after being declared legally dead. So do you want to be an organ donor? How many people would sign up if they knew these facts? Here's more lack of informed consent. The general perception is that transplant science just keeps on improving, but the data shows otherwise. The current unethical system is just getting worse. Between 2017 and 2020, the average one-year survival rate for transplant recipients decreased by 13.6%, and the five-year survival rate decreased by 36%. We need better, more ethical treatment. So let's talk about the elephant in the room. What about people who need a heart transplant? People dying in need of a heart transplant is a tragedy, I admit it. But it is also a tragedy that living people are being killed by organ harvesting under the UDDA. I believe if we hadn't been pouring all our research and monetary efforts into the current unethical system, science likely would have come up with safe ethical solutions by now. And I'd also like you to consider that transplant recipients are being harmed by the lack of truly informed consent. I've spoken with many people who have either received a transplant or have unknowingly given a sibling or a spouse to be harvested in absence of the facts. And when they find out, many are grief stricken. I mean, even though it's not their fault that they made the best decision they could with the information they had available at the time, they feel sorrow and resentment that their conscience was violated because they were not given all the facts. So here's our action steps. First, become aware of the updated information on organ harvesting and transplant. 
Uh, second, educate your patients so they can make truly informed end of life decisions. Third, I'd like to ask you all to write a letter of expert opinion and recommendations to the Uniform Law Commission opposing the RUDDA and advocating for an opt-out from death determination by neurological criteria if they do pass such a law. If you look at our website, our, we have a January blog post which reviews the RUDDA changes, which would help you write a letter. And then recently, the Florida State Legislature, just out of left field, recently enacted a law which prevents citizens of that state from being able to file a lawsuit over a contested brain death diagnosis. So our most recent blog post is a sample letter to send to your own state representatives, asking them to protect patients and families who are dealing with brain injuries. So... Please check out our website, respectforhumanlife.com, where you'll find a quick review of the things we've discussed today and periodic updates on transplant topics in the news. Our book was written for the lay public. It's easy to read and understand for your patients. And I like to finish up my talks with a shout out to Dr. Paul Byrne, who has been advocating for proper medical care for potential organ donors since at least 1975. And a big thank you to Dr. Byrne and Dr. Christine Zayner for reviewing my slides and for their many valuable suggestions. And this concludes the prepared section of my talk. Uh, for the sake of time, and I see I'm running long, I'm sorry about that, I wasn't able to include my slides on xenotransplants or the use or non-use of anesthesia for organ donors. So if anyone wants to review those topics during the Q&A, they make for an interesting discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Klasik. That is just tremendously powerful information you presented and, and upsetting in so many ways, but really appreciate you taking the time to share this with us tonight. And we have a number of questions in the Q&A box already and, and a lot of people commenting in, in, in the chat room as well. So we'll, we have about a half an hour for Q&A, so we'll see what we can, we can get to here. All right, um, so if you'd like to ask your question verbally, please click the raise hand button and we'll, we'll get to you and unmute you. The raise hand button should be at the, the bottom of your Zoom screen there. And just to follow up, uh, Dr. Klasik, I really appreciate you. I'll, I'll start out with a comment here. I really appreciate you putting the action steps at the end of the presentation there that's, so people can have some tangible things they can do to help push back on this this, tra the, this travesty. And, and I know AAPS wants to help with that. So I know we will be sending out an action alert about about the uh, uniform commission changes and to inform people about it and and giving them you know some ideas on how they can take action on that and i know aps is also planning to write a letter no oh, thank you so on much. that topic it's very important yeah thank you so also we will be sharing the slides afterwards you will have a link to the the slides and you'll be able to to review all the different um parts of the presentation there. That was one of the questions we have in the Q&A box is, how can I get the paper to sign to refuse involuntary donations of organs? And I know one of your earlier slides had a, a card that, that people could, could print out and carry with them. That's right. So on our on our website, um, on the homepage, if you go to the bottom of the homepage, there is a link to the Halo Voice, uh, I refuse to donate card there. Also on uh, Dr. Paul Burns' website, the Life Guardian Foundation, he has one as well. Excellent, uh, thank you, thank you. Let's see, do we have any, no hands raised. All right, you're, um, please raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question verbally. There are quite a few comments and questions here in, in the Q&A box. And, and I, I got distracted distra uh, directing traffic a few minutes ago. And I know when we were talking on Monday, Dr. Klesig, you talked about, uh, you know the whether anesthesia whether these um, or organ donors receive anesthesia, and that there are several questions about that. Is the patient anesthetized during during this harvesting? 
Sure. I'll, I'll, I'm just going to zip through my slides. You get to see the cute little pink piggy. Just a minute. I'll get to the. Okay. Yeah. There's several people asking about that, so it would be valuable to. All right. To here we go. Cover that. It. All right. Thank so, you. will will I receive an anesthetic when I donate my organs after supposed death? Right. Well, you know, I'm a recovering anesthesiologist, so I, I want to talk about this. Um, here's what an article I picked, and in, in I didn't pick this one, you know, very specially. They're all very similar to this. This is a uh, anesthesia journal article, Anesthetic Considerations in Organ Procurement Surgery and Narrative Review, which reviews splendidly everything from fluid management to endocrine theory to be sure you use a neuromuscular blocker to prevent movement during the surgery. I mean, how upsetting to the, the operating room team, but it does not even mention actual anesthesia, not a word. Uh, doctors Miller and Trug that we mentioned earlier in their book review the European anesthesia literature debate about whether the brain dead donor should be given anesthesia. And they found two responses. First, uh, one group said, since brain dead patients retain some brain functions, we cannot be sure that they don't feel pain during the harvest. I mean, blood pressure and heart rate increase with incision. Therefore, an anesthetic should be given just to be on the safe side. The other group disagreed, but surprisingly, their position was not based on the claim that the patients were incapable of experiencing pain. Instead, they were concerned that if the public learned that anesthesiologists were giving an anesthetic to dead patients, it would make them suspicious that the dead patients really weren't dead. So really, if you're an organ donor, you are completely at the mercy of who's ever on call for anesthesia that night. I mean, interestingly, author Dick Teresi who wrote a book uh, entitled The Undead in, I think, 2012, he actually offered his local organ procurement organization his organs if he could be assured that he would receive an anesthetic during the harvest surgery. He even offered to change his will to provide payment for the anesthetic, but the OPO would not give him any guarantees of anesthesia. So um, honestly, you may or may not get an anesthetic, very likely not, is what I would say. I No, no words, no words. I, I don't know what to say. Thank you for enlightening us, uh, Dr. Klesig. Let's see, we do have some hands raised here and let's go to, uh, Dr. Mascoro, I'm going to click the button to unmute you. You may have to click that you agree to be unmuted, but uh, please go ahead and um, make your ask your comment, ask your question or make your comment, Dr. Mascoro. Thanks for joining us. And please click on mute if you're seeing an unmute button there. Okay, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. welcome, yeah, welcome to the Dr. webinar. Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Klesik for doing this. I. Uh, I'm an anesthesiologist myself, not quite retired, but uh, getting close. I read your book several months ago, and it disturbed me so much because I was already familiar with how in Texas, um, uh, the, the states and morticians can harvest your corneas without your knowledge. So after reading your book, I thought the best way to protect myself was to get a medical alert uh, uh, necklace. And my medical alert says, um, uh, basically no, uh, let's see, I put, I'm, I have put my name and I put MD after my name to hopefully give it a little extra oomph. I said, I am not an organ donor. I'm not a tissue donor. I'm not a corneal donor. And then it says see wallet card. Um, of course I added that to my medical alert tag that now the, the other tag that says no COVID shot and no flu shot, which uh, you know, they're mandating so much and have been mandating uh, there at the hospital where, where uh, you know, most of us work. So anyway, thank you so much for, for doing this and especially the end to uh, give people a, an action alert as to what they can do to, to actually influence this. And I've bought several copies of your book and uh, handed some of them out at work. And some of the people I share this with just, they're, they're dumbfounded like I was when, uh, when I first read the book. So thank you so much for doing this. You're welcome. You know, I'm I'm in total agreement. My husband actually thought that maybe he'd have 
I am not an organ or tissue donor tattooed across his chest. So I get, I get that feeling. Absolutely. And, you know, I don't, I don't blame medical professionals for, for being dumbfounded. I mean, I am as culpable as anyone. When I was a anesthesia resident, they told me to go up to ICU and, and pre-op the organ donor for surgery. And I was like, whoa, you know, I asked my attendee, is, is there anything I, I need to know? And, and he said, well, you know, just be sure that someone's actually declared in brain dead. You know how eager the transplant team could be. And I went up and, and did the whole pre-op. I brought him to the operating room. I had a different attending supervising me for the procedure. And so the, when he asked me my care plan, I said, well, you know, I guess I'll give him some narcotic to blunt, you know, his hemodynamic responses and I'll give him a neuromuscular blocker to prevent movement. And, and thankfully, my attending said, well, why don't you give him something uh, to blunt consciousness? And I asked him straight out. I said, well, wait a minute, you know, isn't, isn't this man dead? And he just looked at me and said, just in case. And he walked away. You know, so here I was, and, and there I was right in the belly of the beast. I, I took a young man who deserved my protection, and I held him down with anesthetic drugs while they killed him by removing his heart and lungs and livers and kidneys. And it seemed wrong. It seemed wrong to me. But, you know, at the time when you're in medical training, a lot of things seem odd or wrong, and you sort of chalk it up to inexperience, and I just accepted what my authorities told me. But I, I remembered the case because at one point, the blood pressure didn't come down to more narcotic. And so I, I topped up the midazolam that I'd been instructed to give, and the blood pressure came down. And it just makes me sick to think that that man might have had any kind of awareness, but it's certainly a possibility. So may God forgive me. I mean, I do this so that other people won't have to feel what I felt and feel when I remember that case. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Klossig. And that was that was one of our questions was how did you how did you become interested in this topic? And that that may be part of the answer right there that you right. just told us about. Right. Thanks for, for telling us. There are a number of people asking if there will be a replay available. Yes, we will share a link to this following the webinar. It may not be ready until tomorrow, but everybody who registered will get the link to watch it, um, watch the replay that you can share with others. And we hope to get the video and, and the PDF of the slides up on the website as well. Fantastic. The more people that see this, the better. Everybody needs to, to see this. Okay, let's see. Let's go to another hand that's raised. Uh, Abigail Nobel. Uh, Abigail, I'm going to click on mute on my end. You may have to click it also on yours, but then please go ahead and and join the webinar here. Thank you so join much. Join the conversation. Thank you. Hi, we can hear you there. Good. Um, I became aware of the issue by watching state health policy some years ago, Michigan passed a law allowing a specific freestanding organ transplant, um, like a surgery center, but dedicated for that. And it was because there were so many people uncomfortable in the hospitals at what was going on at declaring death. And, and I'm just horrified that such a thing exists and the potential for abuse. So that's something to look for in your state see if there is such a thing already, because they kept the lid on it. A lot of people don't even know it exists in Michigan. And then this past year, there was a pair of bills that went through and the pretext may have been the aftermath of COVID, but I'm very concerned because they changed the accountability and the role of the county medical examiners in declaring cause of death. And they loosened it to such an extent that um, it, it completely removes the uh, local um, personal physician from the responsibility of signing the death certificate. Um, if they aren't available and they, their designated person isn't available, they, the final responsibility is with the medical director of the State Department of Health and Human Services. 
it, so uh, just be aware that, I mean, your state law is like your final authority in a lot of these local matters of declaring deaths. So yeah, that's horrifying. I had no idea about either one of those. I mean, a freestanding death center. Great, right? That's horrifying. Yeah. All right. So thank uh, you for bringing yeah. this to greater awareness. I really appreciate it. You're yeah. welcome. All right. Thank you, Abigail, for, for that information. Okay, let's see. We have some other hands raised. So uh, Bridget, we'll be coming to you next, but so get ready. I just... Um, looking at the other questions that we have here. All right, um, Bridget, we'll go ahead. I'm going to click allow to talk on my end. You may have to unmute on your end, and then please go ahead and, and ask your question. Oh, I'm from Michigan, and I have a friend who works for the tissue donation side of Gift of Life in Michigan, and she has told me about that freestanding place. Mm. Her, She's worked there for a year or so, and I think that that she's totally oblivious. I don't know whether giving her the book to read would be helpful or not. I also have a friend whose son was born with some horrible heart condition. He's four months old now on an artificial heart while they wait for a heart to be born, for some baby somewhere to die so that they can put a heart into this little boy. And, and that conflicts me too. I was her Stephen minister. I was supposed to be supporting her as she goes through this difficult time. <laughs> I, I think, you know, I've never signed a donor card, never, ever. And, and this is just overwhelming to think that yeah. two people in yes. my life are this way. Yeah, no, it, it is hard. You know, and the thing is, um, there was a Minnesota surgeon, Dr. Harold Kletchka, who back in the 70s and 80s developed a working implantable artificial heart with that needed very little power. It would generate, you know, you can use your own internal implanted power supply. Because transplants were where all the rock and roll was going on, he had a very hard time getting help. He had a hard time getting funding. He finally got a private cadre of investors and then those investors tried to steal his idea so he ended up sh you know shutting his own program down just to keep control of it but it's not that other technologies aren't out there they are it's just that this 48 billion dollar industry squelches all competition amazing so there is a way to give him a heart without well, taking babies a baby's life well, it, there might have been by now if it had been allowed to be developed. I mean, I think these things could be developed, but they're, yes, they're, not, they're yes. not here now, I'm afraid. Absolutely. I understand. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for putting the presentation together. It's very interesting. All right. Uh, thank you, Bridget. And yeah, there are there are a few questions. Yeah, what well, so what what do we do for people who need organs? And and I think you just answered you, earlier in the presentation, you talked about living donation, that that's one aspect. And and right now you mentioned how we've crowded out other solutions that that could by by not um, by pursuing this path instead of looking at other other more ethical options. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I th you know, and I think I think patients, if they understood the facts, would actually be more likely to be willing to be a living donor. I mean, we had, you know, someone that we knew from church, and he needed a liver transplant, but he had. This is before I, you know, I got involved. He he made the decision that he would not accept a donation from one of his family members because he thought he could wait and get someone, you know, someone who had already died to give him his liver, not knowing, you know, the facts about this case. So I think in a funny way, if the public were actually given the truth about this, I think way more people would be you know, open to and willing to do living donation, which really is possible for almost everything, you know, except the heart, obviously, but for many, many cases, this would be a good option. Okay, thank you. All right, here's a question from the Q&A box. And I'm kind of interested in the answer to this too. Uh, how many brain dead people might recover with hyperbaric oxygenation? 
you know any has, thoughts on that has it been studied no because they're dead and we're going to make it a self-fulfilling prophecy they're dead by harvesting their organs and by terminating their care short of that so I think there I of course some would be I mean did you see what I said about Sam Parnia who said that after a modern hypothermic resuscitation it might take seven days after rewarming but people don't give them that chance. So yes, I, I think with oxygen therapy, a, a number would be safe, but we just don't know because we're not doing it. All right, uh, thank you. All right, let's see, Robert Gorkin, we're going to go to you next here. I'm gonna click unmute. You may have to do that as well. Robert, welcome. Uh, yeah, am I? Oh, here we go. Yep, oh. we hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, sir. All right. Look, I, I really uh, very much appreciate the, this uh, discussion. And um, Dr. Klesik, I thought you did a great job. Just a brief, you know, okay. one second sentence. I'm, my background is PhD, MD, JD. And uh -huh. for a long time, I've been concerned about anesthesia prior to organ uh, harvesting. And I just wanted to point out, I, I forgot the name of the author, but there was a, a book I read recently that showed pictures of anencephalic children. These are children that have no cerebral cortex, okay? And um, they were uh, uh, taken to uh, uh, Disney in, in Florida. And you can see that they're smiling and enjoying their, uh, um, their event. They're responding. So, you know, even I don't have I don't have any really good idea if there is even some residual type of, uh, uh, you know, S. Loretta type of EEG that would even be you would even record. But you're certainly not going to have a flatline EEG on these people because they don't have any cortex. Uh, no, that's they, they are people. And Dr. Um, Dr. Schumann, together with uh, Dr. Byrne, boy, a while ago, I want to say it was in the. 90s, I can't even remember how long ago, wrote, co wrote a, a, a scholarly paper studying anencephalic children and found that they they were they were people they reacted to their environment they they were not you know just bags of organs waiting to be donated right they are people. Well, thank you, and you know that once again, I think supports the whole concept of considering anesthesia as a routine measure. I, I don't know to what extent it compromises the actual organ in, in surgery. I don't no, know that it, it necessarily doesn't. would, but it uh, it's certainly something that would be an ethical thing to do as a general practice. That's right. Thank you, Dr. Gorkin, for, for those comments. Okay, we here's a one from the Q&A box. I have seen patients declared brain dead while they were still able to maintain an adequate blood pressure without vasopressors. Isn't maintenance of blood pressure actually a brain function and thus fails the requirement of cessation of total brain function? Can you comment on that? Oh, absolutely. So I, during the talk, I was you know, continuing to come back to the role of the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is a part of the brain, and it is what gives us hemodynamic stability. But in the AAN guidelines for brain death determination, and particularly in the, the, revi the revision that's being proposed, the hypothalamus is not being tested. Only certain brainstem reflexes, and not even all of those, are being tested. So yes, the, the hypothalamus is a part of the brain. It gives hemodynamic stability. Many brain-dead supposed people are much more stable than many other ICU patients who have uh, injuries of other kinds. You know, uh, Alan Calloway had the, the little boy that was a near drowning uh, was determined to be brain death. He is hemodynamically stable and able to be kept at home. I mean, these people are, are way more stable than a lot of other ICU patients who we know are alive, right? So your question is correct. These people can be stable because of a functioning part of their brain, namely the hypothalamus. Thank you. Thanks for the question and for the answer. I'm not seeing any more hands raised right this minute. So if we do have a little more time, if you'd like to get your question in, raise your hand. There are some more in the Q&A box here. Um, we have a question. What are your thoughts on the risks and benefits of paid donors versus pure donations? 
And I know you touched on this maybe a little earlier in your presentation about Iran's the only country that apparently allows uh, people to pay for organs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's it's a it's a it's very dangerously close to something that could be used in an exploitative sense, right? So there was there was some legislation proposed earlier this year, um, which was that uh, prisoners, I forget which state maybe Massachusetts, I don't remember for sure, were to be offered early release if they would consent to be an organ and tissue donor. Now that's that's coercion. That's that's not voluntary. Uh, so I would say that you know, any type of payment, payment in kind, payment in, in dollars and cents, I think is um, it's unethical. I mean it's it if you go with a you know old testament New Testament look at it. I mean, selling yourself for money in any way is 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 an unethical thing, and I think it would fall under that category. Thank you for the question and the answer. And let's see. Oh, we got uh, Kenneth, and I Kenneth. I'm not going to be able to take a stab at your last name there, but Kenneth, please click the unmute button and proceed with your question or comment? Well, it's it's Dr. Kenneth Najadlik. That's okay. not Thank Sometimes you, Dr. Najadlik. I appreciate However, the help there. Um, in that, you mentioned you, uh, at least as a resident, participated in an organ harvesting, now either as an attending or in private practice. Uh, I'm sure, I'm not sure, but if you haven't participated in a harvesting or a transplant, what was your definition that the patient was dead? Well, the way my life turned out after residency, and, and as far as I remember, there was only one harvest during my residency, because honestly, they give the harvest surgeries to the newbies. I mean, because what can happen, they're already dead, right? So as you proceed through residency training, you do the recipients, which are, are very technical and, and difficult anesthetics, because these are very sick people. Um, when I went into private practice, I only practiced operating room anesthesia for one year, and, and I don't remember any, don't, you know, I was not in a major community that did transplant, but I don't remember any. And then, you know, I found out I missed talking to my patients. So I, I transferred out of the operating room and went into full-time pain management practice. So it, it did not affect me uh, throughout the rest of my career. So in, in, in essence, you're saying you have not participate in anything other than that one organ harvesting as a resident and all of your subsequent pieces of this paper have been based on other people's findings. Would that be correct? Would that be an honest? Statement? Yes, that's correct. I did this through research and reading and speaking with the yeah. authors of the papers that I reviewed. Well, my background is I was a transplant anesthesiologist for the better part of 35 years. And I've participated on both ends uh, as a, uh, not myself, but the patients were recipients and we did organ harvesting. And um, we can read all the papers we want about when someone is dead, what can happen, who is the outlier. But the point in fact is a decision has to be made at that time on that table. What what is the decision? You're deciding these people are biologically dead with their yeah. hearts beating on the table? You're deciding that these people don't have a quality of life that deserves. No, not discussing their quality of life at all. Continuing? What, at what is the judgment that you're making? My judgment is that the patient, in terms of all of the other physicians, my co-physicians have worked with them. And um, unlike the people, evidently, that you uh, relate to or have referenced are not uh, money-hungry surgeons or anesthesiologists looking to make a business out of the transplant world, a patient has, someone has to make that decision as to when they are dead. We all know that people's hair grows up to three days after they've been buried. So are they dead because there's still cellular function? No, the, the, the hair does not grow. The skin shrinks, giving the appearance of growth. This is not hair growth. Well, so I, 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 would, myself, I would like to differ on that, but we can argue about that in another yeah, time. Let's yeah. get back to the main point here is that, that um, you're not in a position to say someone is dead or not, but from what everyone you've read uh, with their outliers, the gentleman with the cowboy hat on 
who came back to life uh, other, with the other millions, and I, I put it in the terms of millions of heart, lung, liver transplants we've done, kidney transplants. There aren't been too many guys with cowboy hats on that walk away living. Well, and we I, have all over a dozen decide, on our survivors. How do we decide? Well, my point is, in, in your mind, tell me, how do you decide that someone is really dead so they can then become a donor? What makes a donor? Let's, a, that's okay. a simple question. Yeah, I'll, I can answer that. So death is the loss of the integrative function of the organism as a whole. So when our organs stop working together as a functional whole, we become apneic, we become asystolic, we become cold, stiff, and gray. I, I like my dead people cold, gray, and stiff, personally. Um, these people cannot donate organs because they very quickly become ischemic. They can be tissue donors. I have no problem with that. What bothers me is taking people who their hearts are still beating, they're oxygenating with the help of a ventilator, and their, their spirit still resides in their bodies. They're not dead until they are killed on the table by organ harvesting. So what I'm saying is if you want an organ, they are available through living voluntary donation. Both I've not yet met a living heart donor. I'm there sorry. Aren't, I agree. There's no way to do a heart Thank because you. they've they've X that out. There's the development of the implantable artificial heart has not proceeded, though I wish it would. So, so that ev evidently, from what I heard you say about the soul and the spirit, until someone's soul or spirit leaves, they're not dead. Is that a reasonable assumption from what you just said? Well, there's no way for us to see that happening. So the only evidence we have as doctors, I mean, as doctors, we're physical scientists, is when biologic death occurs. And you're defining uh -huh. biologic death as the integrative functions all stopping when the patient's uh, temperature drops to what, um, room temperature? Is, you wouldn't do a harvest until someone's was at room temperature? Is that what you're saying? I, I would not harvest anyone with a beating heart. I would not harvest anyone that's still capable of being resuscitated. I mean, and we found even with Dr. Jaffe's case series, people auto-resuscitated up to 10 minutes after cardiac arrest. So even 10 minutes later, they're still resuscitating themselves without medical help. These people are not dead if they can be resuscitated. All right. Thank you, Dr. Najadlik, for, for participating tonight and, and, and for asking your questions. Yeah, the, these are very these are hard questions. And um, thanks for being a part of part of the discussion tonight. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we are going to we're getting close to needing to wrap up, but we still have a few more hands and a few more questions. Uh, one that in the Q&A box is, can you comment on the case in Florida? I can't recall the name. I think this might be the Schiavo case, the Terry Schiavo. Husband wanted his wife killed and parents wanted her kept alive. Uh, why was he allowed to kill her? Uh, do you have any thoughts on the, the Schiavo the Schiavo case? That was, that's been a while now. Yeah, that's been a while. And, you know, and she was not brain dead. This, the woman was, was not brain dead. And this was settled under the state law at the time. You know, do I have personal feelings about it? Yes, I, I can't comment on the on the legal case. Okay, the AAPS did weigh in on that case at the time in in her in support of not killing her. And I, if I can find it, I'll share that link on, on what AAPS had to say and the, about it. Uh, I think we did try to help her. Okay, let's let's take one more uh, raised hand here, uh, Nina. Nina, I unmuted you. You may have to unmute yourself. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Hi. We welcome. Please go ahead. This is a, a off off topic, so I apologize for bringing it up. I've had the same. I do have a concern ab about this topic. And my granddaughter had a check donor on her driver's license when she first started driving. And I think her parents thought, you know, that was very honorable. But I am have always been worried about what really happens. 
So this has been quite insightful. I really appreciate it. That is on topic. Um, I have a, a, a con similar concern for not hospice care per se. I understand when people are suffering and they, you know, they want to be a, uh, to die with some dignity and they have a, their mind to make that decision. I do worry that some people are, they die because they're heavily medicated and eventually they stop breathing. For instance, uh, a patient who's a dementia patient and uh, if a doctor decides, well, you know, they can't really don't have a good function of life um, and they're in some kind of pain. Uh, like I know someone that she had a lot of falls and in, in the last fall she had, uh, she was, she was in pain, but not constantly, just when she moved in certain ways. She was also, her dementia was progressing. And the decision was made for her to, you know, go to hospice. And she was uh, dead within three days. So I, like I said, that's off topic. I think. Yeah, well, I don't know if it is. So, I mean, what, do you see a connection between how, how maybe, you know, uh, elderly patients are, are, you know, maybe push towards ending their yeah. lives, either explicitly or, you know, uh, or not, or, or kind of uh, covertly. And, and I mean, that it, it is connected in some way to this, this is about protecting life and, and attacks on life. You know, I think, too, some people might think, okay. well, I, I would just be a burden. So um, yeah. it's a hard, you know, it's hard. <laughs> As a pain, pain management practitioner, I mean, this is something that we would we would help assist patients and families with, uh, whether or not there was hospice care involved, and and you know you can help people to be more comfortable uh, in in terminal conditions, and you have to have a good relationship with the people who are your caregivers, and you know work with people as to what your wishes are. I think that pain management is possible. Uh, at the end of life, and and I'm I'm in agreement with it being provided, but you have to work together with your care team. Okay, yeah, thank you. And there are a lot more questions that we're just not going to get to uh, this evening, and a number of requests to have you back, Dr. Classic. So I hope you'd consider coming back. And and speaking to us again, that people do wanted to did, we're interested in in the other slides that we we skipped tonight. So we need to figure out a time to to have you have you back. Well, thank you. Uh, I have to do that. Yeah, thank you so much. I really just so many uh, comments in the in the chat room and in the Q and A box about how this was this information was was very important for them to hear. So um, with that, I think we'll go ahead and, and sign off tonight. Okay, thank and, you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Klossig. And thanks to all of our attendees. We really great turnout and I'm glad because people need to learn about this. So thanks for sharing the time everybody with us this evening and stay tuned for an email with the CME link and some other information, and we'll we'll see you next time. All right, from all of us at AAPS, have a good good night and a good Memorial Day weekend. Bye for now. <laughs>